Hi, everybody. Welcome back for another episode of The Biz, the Business Integrity School. And I am really excited today to have one of our own, Professor Jennifer Kish Gephardt. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Well, we're glad to have you here. Jennifer joined Walton College in 2010 after receiving her PhD from Penn State. And at Walton College, Jennifer is a professor in the management department for Walton College of Business. She teaches management 4243 Ethics and Corporate Responsibility course, which is near and dear to my heart. And she also sits as a member of my academic advisory board and is uh, incredibly helpful to all of us in that capacity. So thank you for that. Broadly, Jennifer's research interests focus on social issues that affect employees, managers, and organizations. And under this umbrella, she's interested in understanding why individuals behave unethically in the workplace with a particular emphasis on the role of emotions, moral disengagement, and the non-conscience. Quite interesting, and we'll talk about a little of your research here in a minute. Jennifer also studies the roles of status and status-related diversity, such as social class and gender within organizations. Her research has been published in some top-tier outlets, including the Academy of Management Journal, the Academy of Management Review, Annual Review of Psychology, the Journal of Applied Psychology, and Research in Organizational Behavior. And in addition, Jennifer's paper, Encountering Social Class Differences at Work, was a finalist for the 2013 Best Paper of the Year Award at the Academy, Academy of Management Review. Congratulations. Thank you. Jennifer has also received the Faculty Excellence in Service Award and the Faculty, Faculty Excellence in Research Award from Walton College. So my goodness, you have an incredible resume and background and you're now going on like 10 years at being at Walton College. So how does it feel? Does it seem like 10 years or has it gone, uh, gone by quickly? <laughs> you know, that's a great question. I feel like uh, COVID has given us a lot of time to reflect, right? And, uh, yes, and I do think it actually went very quickly. It's hard to believe it's been, uh, I think it's just uh, about 10 and a half years, but you know, wow. 10 and a half years, very good years. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. Well, we are going to jump right into some of the topics today so that we can get to some of the, um, the things that you've written as well and how that all ties together. So there was this article written in the Harvard Business Review, gosh, almost 25 years ago, 26 years ago now, by a guy named Andy Stark, Professor Andy Stark up at the University of Toronto. And he asked a question, um, what's the matter with business ethics? And Believe it or not, that article is still shows up at like near the top of just general Google searches if somebody's typing in business ethics. And when I saw that and thought about it and read the article a couple of times, it just seemed to me that we've done so much in the field since that article was written that it was really time to talk about all of that and find a way to kind of update um, the thinking in that space and to share with everybody some of the changes. So at the time, again, 25, 26 years ago, Andy found and thought that uh, ethics, business ethics, was being taught in a way that was too general and too philosophical and too theoretical. Um, so let me just ask you, you've been teaching at Walton College for 10 years and, and been in the field for a long time. Do you think that his criticisms of the way it was being taught still hold any water today? Yeah, it's a great question. And, um, you know, I'm actually glad that you're revisiting this because I think it's important for us to always reflect um, on what we're doing, you know, and uh, that way we can better ourselves, better growth. Uh, so to your question, I, I don't think it's as much of a problem maybe as it was 25 years ago. Um, what I would say is that, uh, you know, over the last 25 years, we've really seen, uh, maybe you could classify it as two streams of research um, develop within um, uh, business ethics. One kind of from a more normative perspective that focuses on the philosophical, on the what should we be doing question. Mm -hmm. And then another stream that tends to focus on the why do we do what we do, more of a mm -hmm. psychological approach, a more social scientific approach um, to understand the why in the hopes that if we know why people do what they do, then we have a better way of potentially addressing it within organizations and minimizing the potential for those factors to influence unethical behavior. Uh, and so for me, I think that I've, I've seen personally more um, of a focus on that social scientific uh, approach in, um, in classes than in the philosophical approach. Uh, and so I, I don't see that the philosophical side of it, the it's too philosophical, it's too general as being as much of a problem um, as perhaps it was 25 years ago. Yeah, I tend to agree. And the behavioral ethics side of it and the social sciences has been a really important advancement, I think, in the uh -huh. field. 
uh, because you can't, until you understand why something's happening, kind of get to the root cause, it's difficult to then build strategies around it to deal with, you know, what's, what's causing the bad behavior. Definitely. So I think it's being practical. That's the way to do it is to know the why so that it can be very practical for the, um, the, the, the outcomes, the way that we can address that. Exactly. I completely agree. So earlier this year, to that point, uh, the Network for Business Sustainability actually published an article that was titled Three Reasons That Employees Act Unethically. And the article was based on research that you did uh, almost 10 years ago with Linda Trevino, who's also been a guest here on our podcast, and I know you studied under her at Penn State, and David Harrison. And that research uh, resulted in an academic publication as well in the Journal of Applied Psychology in 2010. And that was called bad apples, bad cases, and bad barrels, um, and some meta-analytic evidence about sources of unethical decisions at work. So the article this year was sort of looking back at what you guys had written from an, for an, from an academic perspective 10 years ago and, and kind of putting it into almost layman's terms. So what did you, let's just start with talking about what did you mean by bad apples and bad barrels and, uh, and bad cases? Sure, great question. Uh, so they refer to um, categories of factors that influence unethical behavior. Uh, and so bad apples refers to individual differences, something about the individual, whether a disposition um, or a personality trait that influences why they engage in um, unethical behavior. Um, bad barrels refers to the organizational environments, you know, what is it about the organization, you know, the ethical culture, the ethical leadership, um, uh, code of conduct enforcement, rule enforcement that might influence unethical behavior. And then bad cases uh, refers to the situation that, you know, there are characteristics of a situation that, um, you know, might lean a person more towards engaging in unethical behavior than another situation. So. Right. Um, magnitude of consequences or even the opportunity to uh, to get away with it. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I, and sometimes there's a mix of, would you say all three of those um, that Absolutely. arise? Absolutely. So not like they're individual separate things, maybe, but they could also all live together in, in one situation when you look at it and try to explain it. Definitely. I think actually we do ourselves a disservice when we try to focus on one as the primary explanation for something and avoid yeah. or ignore the other two. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of the things that I like to, um, to ask my students in class is, uh, you know, who does it benefit to make a bad apples argument or who does it benefit to make a bad barrels argument? And inevitably they, um, they uh, come down to the opinion that with bad apples, it actually benefits a company to say, the bad apples are the problem because then the company doesn't have to look internally and look at what could potentially right. be in their environment. Right. Uh, and in some ways it helps us as a society too, to say, oh, it's just evil people that are doing unethical behavior. It uh -huh. would never be a normal person like me, a, a person who really wants to do the right thing normally. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is so interesting. And if you look at the, you know, the bad barrel and say that it, you know, it's a, who would that benefit if they were talking about it's the bad barrel? What do your students say then when you ask them that? That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> it benefits the employee, you know, I mean, because it's very easy, easy to diffuse responsibility. My boss told me to do it. Other people in the organization are doing it. Uh, I wasn't going to get the bonus if I didn't do it. Yeah. And if a company doesn't be able, or if they're not able to step back and kind of look at all of it together, then you don't ever really get to fixing systemic problems that may very well exist. And even, in bad, even in bad apple situations, there can be systemic issues that from organizationally should be addressed. So, For sure, yes. I, I love that analogy, thinking that way, bad apples, bad cases, and, and bad barrels. That's, that's, that's really cool. So let me ask you another question then about, you know, all of the different, you know, bad apples and bad cases and bad barrels. And how does, how does, is there a connection? Let me just ask you that, that ask it that way. Is there a connection between that at all, do you think, Jennifer, and, um, uh, stakeholder theory and thinking about all the different, you know, stakeholders that come into play in a particular situation. Like I'm thinking about the business roundtables pronouncement last year about um, the whole purpose of a corporation and how it really isn't anymore, uh, according to the business roundtable, the, for the benefit of just the shareholders, it's for the benefit of all the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about suppliers and you're talking about customers and you're talking about employees and you're talking about the community. Does that in some way cause even a greater diffusion, if you will, of potential um, responsibility if something goes wrong, do you think? 
You know, my my initial reaction to this, and I, I might have to give it some more thought, but my initial reaction is that um, that it wouldn't diffuse responsibility as much. If anything, I think it, it forces um, companies, managers within companies to think a bit broad, more broadly about who they're going to be affecting with their decisions, right? Yeah. Um, and perhaps might make them more... Um, uh, more aware of the the perspective of those various stakeholders. You know, they yes. may feel the need to actually go out and find out more information about how that stakeholder group might um, perceive this particular information. And so, yes. I think that it might actually be beneficial. I mean, I believe that it must be beneficial to um, to consider multiple stakeholders in that decision making. Yeah, yeah. I hadn't really thought about it. I just, you know, was was thinking about. Uh, I think you're probably right. It probably causes them to think more broadly about how their decisions are affecting um, the different constituencies as opposed to maybe diffusing the decision making at all. But so what do you, let, let me ask you this, what do you think about um, the new pronouncement by the business roundtable? And of course, one of the, the, the constituencies that they mentioned in terms of a shareholder or sorry, a stakeholder was in fact suppliers and dealing ethically with suppliers and, you know, thinking broadly about communities and, and employees and not just the shareholder. Do you bring that into your classes at all? This new statement, do you talk about it with your students and how does it affect your business ethics teaching? Yeah, great question. Uh, yes. So the uh, short answer is yes. Uh, do bring it in. Uh, do talk about it. Um, you know, it really, what I think it does is it provides legitimacy um, to arguments that have been made for quite a bit of time. Uh -huh. uh, and I were speaking earlier about Ed Freeman, um, professor at, uh, at the Darden School at the University of Virginia. Yep. And uh, Ed has been a um, longtime proponent of a multiple stakeholder perspective. Uh, I also think about the, um, the credo that Johnson & Johnson is known for, which um, I was going back and, and looking and I was surprised that the, the, the credo has been around since 1943. And that credo very explicitly points out um, the company's responsibility as they see it to multiple stakeholders. Uh, and uh, so it is kind of, as I see it, an early evidence of a multi multiple stakeholder approach to thinking about how um, their decisions are going to influence people. Wow. Wow. Yeah. When, when Ed and I spoke, I said, you must have just been like jumping up and down in the room when you saw the new pronouncement from the business roundtable. You know, he was like, felt like he was sort of the canary in the coal mine, I think, for years with thinking that way, other than the credo that you mentioned. 1943. Wow. Yes. Yes. Yeah, been wow. around a very long time. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I would say too that I think that the um, the roundtable decision uh, is probably reflective too of society more general, kind of pushing the issue that we do yes. need to think a bit more broadly about um, mm -hmm. the purpose of of business and who the mm -hmm. stakeholders are. Mm -hmm. Have you um, have you seen any examples that you can think of of how that has come to life through COVID, um, or even with the racial tension that we've seen in the U.S lately with some companies, so many of them, in my opinion, have kind of stepped up to the plate and made pronouncements about things they're going to do. You know, maybe the proof is still in the pudding, sort of like with the business roundtable pronouncement. It was great on paper, but it's all going to, you know, we'll have to see what the businesses actually do. But I know that particularly during the time of COVID, if companies didn't focus on their employees as opposed to their profits, it was pretty clear they were going to face some, some serious backlash. Um, for that, you know, Edelman did a, they have the trust barometer report that they do every year and um, they did a supplemental report in light of COVID on that exact question. And, and essentially people were saying um, who they surveyed, if there's a company that isn't more focused on their employees than profits right now, then w they wouldn't even go back and visit the company again because they just felt like they wouldn't have been able to trust the company. So mm -hmm. I kind of feel like the business roundtable pronouncement may have sort of fast forwarded um, some actions because of COVID and, and the racism issues. The companies have been forced to address issues, social issues. Um, I would say in a different way. I mean, CEOs, Jennifer, you know as well as I do, they don't, in the past, they didn't wade into kind of social statement questions um, and feel as though they have to answer them as much as I think now CEOs find themselves almost needing to provide an answer to their employees. Have you seen a change there, do you think, too? You know, um, I actually, I'm I don't have specific examples of that, um, but uh, one of the one of the examples that came to mind as you were are speaking uh, related to Black Lives Matter is yeah. that um, you know higher education institutions have really been yeah. 
forced into thinking Definitely. how they deal with um, race issues. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, part of that, though, uh, even though we had this mass movement of, of protests happening, mm -hmm. um, Part of what motivated, you know, the real um, the real change or or uh, the movements uh, within the organization or within the higher education institutes um, came from, you know, Twitter and uh, people talking about, you know, what is it what is it like to be black at this particular institution or another institution? And I think a lot of um, higher ed institutions that thought they were doing, um, you know, fairly well, uh, ha were forced to face, um, uh, you know, a, a difficult, a difficult reality, and uh, and and that's motivating change. And so, you know, I don't know if the roundtable itself is, um, if that proclamation has um, you know, trickled down into paying attention to stakeholders or are stakeholders speaking up more. Are they yeah. making more salient? Uh, yeah. That's why I wonder if the roundtable pronouncement isn't in part because um, people in society are expecting more of their organization. Right. You're right. It almost could have been a bubbling up as opposed to sort of a pronouncement down because in this, the power of, of digital media and the, the power that it puts in an individual's hands in order to be heard is, is pretty amazing, actually. And Absolutely. you're right. The statement could have almost been a response and in reaction to this different world we live in today, this transparent, connected world that we live in. And, and individuals are saying, that's what we expect of you. And they're could have been saying, okay, we agree with you and we're going to actually say it now. So yeah, <laughs> it'd be interesting way to think about it. So when you think then, Jennifer, uh, as you've reflected um, on business ethics and where it's been, kind of that was exemplified by Andy's article and you well know where it is now and you've contributed to where it is now with your great research on behavioral ethics. Where do you think it needs to go in the future? Like if you were to sort of look out over the next 25 years and think about the future of business ethics. Are there like three words or phrases that you think should be captured there? Well, so um, I think that uh, the future is bright. Uh, I think that there's um, a lot of opportunity to be impactful, to continue to be impactful. Uh, and I think innovation and imagination are gonna have to be a part of yeah. where in the future. And I love this quote from Ed Freeman. Uh, he was speaking recently at uh, Trinity College in Dublin, or at least virtually with them. Right. And something that he said is that if you have to make trade-offs among stakeholders, it is a failure of imagination. Um, that we need to help people as business schools uh, to figure out their creative imagination. And I, I just thought, that. yeah, especially in light of what we were just speaking about with multiple stakeholders, uh, you know, in consideration. And so if we start thinking about it that way, maybe there is a way that we can be more imaginative, more innovative. Because yeah. it's like the balance. It's like, no, the tension shouldn't pull you apart and you shouldn't be making, making trade-offs. You need to hold it all together and yeah. figure out how to do that, which is going to require a lot of innovation and ingenuity and creativity. Oh, I like that. That's cool. That's Absolutely. Really cool. I agree. So that makes me very optimistic about the future. Yeah. Um, you know, and also, I think when I when I look back um, just 10 years from where I started in, um, you know, after my PhD program, yeah. a lot has changed just within behavioral ethics as a research, uh, as a research stream. Uh, behavioral ethics research shows up in our top tier publications on a regular basis. There is a large group of people who are studying this, who are doing really interesting creative research. Um, we are finding out new things about the way that unethical behavior works that we didn't know 10 years, let alone 25 years ago. And so something that, um, you know, probably when you spoke to Linda Trevino came up back in the 1980s, when she started working in this field, she was told that this is just, this is, this is just going to be a fad. It's just a niche right. and you're not going to get tenure off of this. And clearly right. we are way beyond uh, a niche. And I think that we're doing, um, we have the potential to do a lot of uh, influential work yet. I would agree. Yeah, she really was a pioneer out there kind of on her own and um, it's not going away. So I would agree. Yeah. This has been exciting to hear you talk about the fact that you've even seen changes in the field in the last 10 years. And I think that we're only in for an exciting ride as we continue forward, given all of the technology and the things that we can do in terms of really measuring the um, impact of ethics and compliance programs. I mean, that's one of the things that I think 
you know, some of the softer skills side of, of management um, can be hard to manage sort of on the HR side or, you know, in ethics and compliance, but the crisper we get at being able to use technology to measure the impact and the more we understand the why people do things, I think then we'll be able to really kind of turn, turn the dial to, to that innovation and ingenuity that Ed talked about to really make the programs a lot more effective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, you know, and, and actually just to add to um, what, what we're seeing, uh, you know, so back 25 years ago in the Stark article, uh, he spoke about, um, you know, that a lot of universities had uh, ethics classes, but I think we've gone much further than that, you know, that the ethics yes. classes um, uh, are uh, perhaps um, taking a different perspective or approach than they may have 25 mm -hmm. years ago. Um, that uh, we're recognizing that a comprehensive ethics program has to be a part of the business um, school, uh, you know, as you're, as you're finding, as you're working on uh, at the Walton College very successfully. Uh, so I think that that's an important piece of it. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And Linda wrote some interesting interesting research there as well, as you know, Linda Trevino about business schools and creating a, a, an ethical culture, which was a which was a great piece. But you're right, I, to, in my opinion, I think it's become much more practical. I think it's become much more analytical, the, you know, kind of the business ethics teaching uh, that is done. And um, so that makes it more applicable, right, for the new managers that are going to get out, because I still think the one thing that new managers don't appreciate when they get out into the working world is that they're actually going to be faced with these dilemmas frequently. Um, and that business ethics isn't just that, you know, class I maybe took over here, but that whether I'm in marketing or merchandising or supply chain or even economics, that issues, just being in the working world means that ethical issues are going to come up regardless of their chosen profession. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that comprehensive approach, I think, is uh, important for us to be able to help young people navigate this new world they're going to find themselves in. Absolutely. Well, and I think yeah, we can think about comprehensive even beyond the business school, right? So within the business school, oh, yeah. we have a strong ethical culture. We have to have, um, uh, you know, we have to help students uh, with understanding, being aware of ethical dilemmas. How do I address ethical dilemmas? Um, you know, and then understanding kind of um, the psychology behind it. But then when they graduate, uh, and they go into an organization, the organizations have to do their parts too, uh, to create yeah. a strong ethical culture because, yeah. you know, just, just knowing what we know about situational influences, organizational yes. uh, influences that, um, you know, one class in college and then graduating and going into um, a company isn't probably going to do it in the space right. of strong um, culture similar to, for example, Enron. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. Very true. Well, Jennifer, this has been a great discussion. Thanks for taking some time out of your day to, to visit with us. And I want to end on some fun questions for you. Tell me what you have been either reading or listening to or watching uh, just for fun, kind of some downtime and in the middle of COVID, but yet you also find these really interesting ethical dilemmas woven into it. <laughs> Anything yeah. fun? Yes, fun. Uh, well, I actually, yes, I think they're fun. I don't know if other people would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, as far as books go, I'm, I'm currently reading through um, Viktor Frankl's book called uh, Man's Search for Meaning, and uh, it is actually about his experience um, in a concentration camp during the Holocaust, uh, which is, you know, very heavy, very tragic, um, but he's looking at it from a, um, a psychological perspective to try to understand, you know, how people coped with that situation and, and the um, uh, the psychology behind kind of different phases people go through when they are forced into this situation. Uh, but what I found was interesting is, um, you know, that he very much sees uh, the way that we deal with any kind of struggle, including the way that he had to decide who he was going to deal with this particular struggle, which I think is an understatement to call it a struggle. But right. uh, his, he, he makes the suggestion that uh, it's almost a, a moral um, decision how we decide to deal with struggles in our lives, um, that there are multiple ways to deal with them and there is a right way to deal with them. And I just thought, wow, how powerful, you know, in a situation like this, that um, someone could be thinking about it from that perspective. So that sounds like a really awesome book. Have you been watching anything that, that has been kind of fun during COVID, but maybe also has an ethical dimension or dilemma or anything embedded in it? Absolutely. Uh, so HBO actually has a show called The Vow, uh, which is focused on a group called Nexium. Uh, and Nexium 
has uh, similar, at least the argument is it has similarities to a cult. Uh, and so they're really getting into the psychology of, um, you know, how this organization operated, how it influenced mm. people. Uh, so again, the psychology basis is what yeah. I find. Oh, really yeah. 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 Um, it also highlights what I would call the, are the whistleblowers of this organization, you know, people who are a part of this organization who really believed in its purpose. Um, you know, and I think a lot of us go into organizations wanting to believe in the purpose of that organization. Yes. And the show shows how difficult it was for them to see, you know, what was, what was underneath that, what was unethical that was going on or what they felt was unethical mm -hmm. uh, and, and the struggle that they had both psychologically, but also, um, you know, just to, just to bring this information um, to light for the public to see. Uh, so that's been a very fascinating show. Well, Jennifer, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for contributing to uh, this season of podcast. Thank you for the work you've been doing in the uh, behavioral ethics space. And I'm just really excited to be able to work with you now in Walton College. And thanks for everything you're doing for us at the college as well. Appreciate it. It's fun you. working with you. You as well. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for having me on today. You bet. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.